So thank you um, for staying in the room with us and for giving us your time uh, this afternoon. We're here to talk about media and the media landscape in the Middle East. And media is a very big word and all-encompassing, but basically media is about telling stories. So what I'd like to do is just first say why I got into media and then um, uh, turn over to the, to my, the panelists. Um, basically, I was working in the nonprofit sector and I realized that there were amazing people and organizations that were doing very worthy, uh, noteworthy uh, endeavors and they were not being covered in mainstream media. Mainstream media in the Middle East was demoralizing, politics focused and really just um, not a place that inspires anyone to do anything in the region, be it investment or, uh, or otherwise. And so I started asking the question is, why is the media the way it is in the region? Uh, well, it's agenda driven, state owned primarily, or um, it is actually a sedative for the masses. Uh, so entertainment, but don't give us anything serious that could actually get people to think. Um, and so this is where I decided to venture into Baraka Bits and deliver positive news, good news from the Middle East, that will enable people globally uh, who are interested in either investing in the region or collaborating with people doing positive things in the region uh, to, to um, be informed about what's going on. We um, are not the only ones, obviously. There are a lot of... Uh, media houses, whether they are providing entertainment, education, uh, uh, or other uh, types of content. I was talking earlier to Hala Fadel about their investment in U-Turn from Saudi. Uh, U-Turn apparently has 85 million viewers per month, and so they're kind of alternative media, and they're doing a fantastic job at keeping uh, Saudi uh, audiences both entertained as well as informed about some political satire. So it's you know an alternative way of talking about issues that matter. So that's it about Baraka Bits with positive news and about the landscape. What I'd like to do is introduce um, people who are working on content in the region. Um, first, we have um, Anna, um, Anna Sowo, who works the Wiki uh, Media Foundation, the parent foundation for uh, Wikipedia, uh, as a major gift officer uh, with the foundation. Uh, Anna has spent six years in the region and has worked with various uh, business and government uh, organizations. And with that, I'd like to turn to her and ask her to step up and, yeah. Mine? Yes, it is. Hi, nice to be here with you guys. Rama, thanks so much for thinking of me and inviting me. So I'll just get right to it. Um, more Arabic speakers are going online, no surprise here. But what internet are they greeted with? According to the United Nations, 370 million Arabic speakers worldwide are met with less than 1% Arabic content. Um, many nations across the GCC have stated aims of knowledge economies. For a knowledge economy, you need a digital knowledge infrastructure. So enter Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. I'm sure most of you know the story behind Wikipedia. Um, so I'll just give you some general current stats. Um, right now, we're the fifth to seventh largest website in the world depending on the score. Uh, we have Wikipedias in over 250 languages, and we have 70,000 active editors. Those are editors that make uh, more than five edits a month. What you may not know is the foundation behind uh, Wikipedia that supports our editing communities. Order of magnitude, we're only 250 people. Each year we raise $68 million largely from an average donation of $15. So um, at the foundation, we believe in free, open Arabic content. And um, the current state is that Arabic Wikipedia is the fastest growing, the fifth fastest growing Wikipedia, measured by the active editors. And Egyptians and Tunisians are the most active right now. 
Something that's important to understand is that the Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation has no editorial control whatsoever. Um, the editing communities do, and I think this is a good thing for Arabic content online. Um, it doesn't have to be Anglo-centric, it doesn't have to be Western-centric, it doesn't even have to be left to right. We really trust you to find your own way. So uh, it's not a command and control situation, it's a nudge and cajole, right? So what are we doing to enable our Arabic-speaking knowledge creators and consumers? I'll walk through just a series of examples, most of them from this year. We have the Wikipedia education program where students and teachers contribute as part of a class project. In four years, we've served more than 15,000 students from 67 countries that have added more than 95,000 articles. We have or have had uh, programs in Tunisia, Egypt, Algeria, Palestine, and Saudi. And the ladies are killing it. Um, we have 87% of the students in the WikiEd program are, uh, are women, and this literally flips our gender gap ratio on its head. In um, other regions, it's about 87% men. So we're pretty pleased about this, and we're trying to look into what the Egyptians might be doing differently so we can close the gap elsewhere. And the number of people on the education team is just four. So I'd say that's pretty significant impact. We have Wikipedia Zero, so uh, Wikipedia is free, but uh, data charges in developing countries are sometimes prohibitive. So we've been developing partnerships with mobile operators to waive data charges in the developing countries. 600 million people now have access without data charges, and we're starting to get 70 million page views per month. Uh, we're just getting started. And the number of people on the Zero team just four. It makes me really happy. <laughs> we also have a content translation tool. I think of it as a human machine collaboration. Uh, you can basically, the, the tool is you can basically do a copy paste from one language to the other and then based on your understanding both of the language and the subject matter, refine it. It takes some of the heavy lifting away of some staple articles. Uh, we ha now have it enabled on all languages as a beta feature for logged in users, and about 10,000 articles have already been translated, and it's been out about six months. And the number of people on the content translation team is just six. None of them are American, by the way. We have Wikimedia grants. This is just some stuff that's going on this year. We were the full sponsors of the first uh, Wiki Arabia conference in uh, 2015. It was in Tunisia. If you look over here in the left-hand corner, that's our executive director who was in full attendance. It was an idea that uh, was developed by the Tunisians that we supported. Uh, Egyptians also came up with the idea of running uh, editing competitions for all Arabic Wikipedias, and we sponsor the uh, prizes. So a lot of times we wait for the ideas from our communities or we support and enable, and when they come up with an idea at a low price point, we invest, see how it goes. If it goes well, we support more of it. Uh, this year we also moved from uh, HTTP to HTTPS, bit of a tongue tire. Uh, it's an encrypted protocol that protects user privacy. It makes it more difficult for governments and other parties to track your behavior online and makes it more difficult for internet, serv internet service providers to block access to Wikipedia. Last but not least, we're suing the NSA um, for spying on our users. So you saw some of the pictures earlier on of the uh, Egyptian contributors. Um, imagine if you knew the NSA is monitoring your behavior online and potentially sharing it with your government, those women will be less likely to share their knowledge. So in collaboration with the ACLU, uh, we've joined forces to take on the NSA so that they can cut it out. And this is our legal team. I just had to show you their picture. I never thought I'd fall for a group of lawyers, but when they decided to sue the NSA, I was definitely in. So how can you get involved? Um, first and foremost, make your voice heard. Offer your knowledge in your own language. If you don't know how to do it, I'll be happy to talk about it with you. Um, and edit and leave your mark. 
Uh, and if that's not an option for you, please donate. Donate.wikipedia.org. Donations begin at $1, and we even take Bitcoin. Thanks so much. So thank you for that, uh, Anna. Uh, up next is Parihan Abu Zaid. Parihan is an MIT Sloan graduate. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Movie Pigs and co-founder of Kabila Media Productions, a digital content creator that operates across the Arab region. Uh, Parihan's also received the best female entrepreneur from the MIT Enterprise Forum competitions. Welcome. How do you think this is working? Okay, you can hear me now? Okay, let me first start by asking, uh, by a show of hands, how many of you like Arabic movies or have watched Arabic movies? Okay, now, how many of you have considered investing or working in the film industry in the Arab region? Two, okay, and that's exactly part of the, the challenge that I'm facing every day. We look at film as a pure source of entertainment. We look at it as a talent, as a, hop as a hobby. We don't look at it as an industry. And that's, how the, that's actually how the, the industry is structured in, in the Middle East. So we all know that um, Egypt is number one in terms of production of film. Well, right now, Egypt is not contributing to the, basically the box office of uh, film globally at all. Uh, pretty much um, Persian movies and Palestinian movies are doing much better. So my job today in the next um, four to five minutes is to convince you that the film industry is a profitable business and you should all go for it, w whether through investment or through working in it. So let's, let's start by the first thing, which is whether there is a market or not. Okay, so if you're looking for a business, is there a market for film or not? And the interesting thing is that if you look at the movies that have been produced out of or came out of the Middle East over the past 10 years, you will find that every single film that has been exported, that means that a film that got theatrical distribution or digital distribution outside of its local, uh, of the Middle East, has made at least 150% on its box office compared to local box office. That includes movies like Paradise Now, that includes movies like Wajda that made 100 and, uh, uh, 1.5 million in the US alone when it was never distributed in Saudi because there are no theaters there. Um, same like for 6, 7, 8. Uh, so many movies that made an, on an average 150% of the local uh, or domestic box office. The other thing, when we look at um, the interna international markets, the growth globally is actually coming from um, foreign box office. In even Hollywood is looking at growth outside of, um, outside of the U.S. Compared, like, as opposed to focusing on the U.S. So to give you an example, for instance, France has a law that um, forces 10% of theaters or 10% of the movies that are um, uh, distributed in theaters to be foreign. That's a $180 million um, opportunity. And Arabs, Arabic movies are actually mo some of the most popular in France. But we only like export, we only have one or two movies that are present in the movie in, in French market every now and then. When I compare that with Egypt, for instance, which is the biggest market in the US, actually I'll give you another example first, uh, Sweden, and that, that's a good a comparison with Egypt. Sweden, which only has less than 10 million people, they have an average penetration of film um, or like tickets, basically box office, of 200%. This means that every, every person on average goes to see mo two movies. Uh, they generate about uh, $0.2 billion of box office every year. Only 19% of that goes towards local film. This means that the majority, over 80%, goes to foreign film. And again, Arab movies are the most popular. Uh, or some of the most popular in their market. If I look at Egypt, the, the one film that made the highest number of box office in Egypt sold only one, uh, 1.5 million tickets and were 84 million people. Well, some say we're 80, some say we're 90 million. So obviously the penetration is not even comparable. Now, so I'm, I've, I guess I, ho I hope I've proven to you that there is a market. But why are movies not there? Why are movies, if we go to Netflix, there are only seven films that are in Arabic. Two of them are produced by non-Arabs. And the majority of them are, um, are 
Oscar nominated, like three of the seven are Oscar nominated films. So why, are, why is Netflix not picking up on Arabic movies? It's not because there is no market, it's just because there is a flaw in the value chain. For an average foreign film to get to be on Netflix, they're, they're, they have to go through any, anything between five to eight different steps or individuals and organizations to actually get a chance of being looked at by Netflix. That is because we're not looking at the film as an industry that, we, that should be exported. We're not looking at movies as something that we can make money off of or as a national priority as a sector. That is very different from what Turkey has done, from what South Korea has done, from what Nigeria has done. Nigeria is now the second largest film producer in the world, a $5.1 billion industry. And only about half a million people go to cinema in Nigeria every year. So obviously the money is coming from abroad. Indonesia is now one of the highest growth in terms of box office as well. And I said Sweden and I said Taiwan and, and also Taiwan and Turkey. So we need to figure out a way to actually go against that value chain or basically crack that value chain and, and, and figure out a way to give a, create a platform for Arabic films to be seen here. The good thing when you look at the US is that um, there is a very specific market for Arabic films. So there's over 100 film festivals that are either Arab or, uh, or Palestinian film festivals in the US and at least 50% of the visitors that go to those are non-Arab. So obviously we need to, to show those films and this is where I come. So I'm, I'm, I'm launching a platform in three weeks. Come and talk to me about it later. I will give you even a free trial um, code. Uh, but it's basically Netflix for Arabic films where you can not only see movies like Walmart or Paradise Now, Oscar nominated films, but you can also connect with the people that made it and you can see them in subtitles so you can actually be able to share that narrative. The last point I wanna mention is, um, and that, that also contributes to the industry itself, uh, there, there was a panel that was talking about the challenges in the Middle East for startups, and I was surprised that talent was not considered as one of the challenges that we have in the region. Everybody, any, I, I started businesses in, in the Middle East, and I know that hiring engineers is very difficult. Hiring people in general is very difficult. It's very difficult in the Middle East. Well, that is not the case in film. There is actually 400,000 Arab filmmakers or talent that have contributed to festivals over the past 10 years that nobody knows about and they, can, they are able to create movies that can be on our platform. Well, I'm happy to say that we have 100 films from 11 countries in the Middle East. All of them are award-winning. All of them have succe succeeded by winning um, either awards or getting a foreign box office, and none of them are on YouTube, so you're gonna have to subscribe to see them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to turn back to Anna and ask you a question. You have an audience of technology uh, investors and entrepreneurs who are interested in the Middle East. How could they help give access um, to content like Wikimedia to people who need the access most that you know of in the Middle East? Well, I think right now the, the challenge is generating that content first. As I said, it's, it's relatively low in uh, Arabic Wikipedia. Um, it's getting a lot easier to edit Wikipedia. Um, if you want to host an edit-a-thon yourself, um, you can contact us. We'll show you the ropes. I'll show you how to edit yourself. It sounds like a very small thing, but once you start making contributions, it's a little bit addictive. I speak from first-hand experience. Um, I'm an editor. Um, so first and foremost, I would say learn how to edit Wikipedia. And, and, and does Wikimedia also offer grants to people who are creating access tools or? We do, we, we run a lot of experiments. So um, aside from offering grants, and grants are not just for organizations, we have individual engagement grants. So yourself as an individual, if you wanna propose a particular line of content in Arabic, you can easily apply for the grants. It's, you know, um, a lot of our grants are at low price points for single individuals. We've done some experimenting in microgrants. One of the things that we heard from our editors in the Middle East was that there wasn't a lot of source material that they had because citations are needed on Wikipedia. So we were, we were uh, experimenting with uh, microgrants of sending people source texts all over the world so that they would have the texts to be able to cite. Ultimately, it proved to be a logistical nightmare, but that's what you learn when you experiment. And what is, so for the value 
you of being on Wikimedia? I mean, I, I know a lot of people use Wikipedia, but for businesses, for entrepreneurs, for organizations that are in tech, how valuable is it? Do they get a lot of hits? Do you have any information about Oh, to be about on. That? Well, we don't think of it as a marketing platform. <laughs> we think of it as a source of knowledge. Um, and you need to be a, a notable figure or from a neutral point of view. So we don't track those kinds of things because we're more like education geeks than we are marketers. Yeah. So. And I'd like to turn to you and ask, what is your experience in terms of the ecosystem supporting media slash tech? So first of all, are you guys investing in any applications or any um, um, technology specific uh, um, supporter of media? And second, are there, uh, is there an ecosystem that supports you? Well, that's why I was actually trying to say that we need to look at it as an industry, not as, as a hobby or a talent or just a source of entertainment because the ecosystem is, is more limiting than it is encouraging to the creation of film or content in, in general. Um, so we're, we're definitely, the, the answer to your second half, of, uh, or the second half of your question, we are a web-based technological platform that tracks, that basically our bread and butter is the recommendation algorithm that tracks users' behavior anonymously, so I'm not gonna know what you're watching, but, uh, but it's basically to understand what, what people want to interact with and what movies should we invest in. Netflix is so proud of how House of Cards was produced that way. Well, we need to understand the same thing about uh, Arabic content. But in terms of ecosystem, so I'll give you a couple of anecdotes that will, will give you a sense of what the region is like when it comes to filmmaking. So first of all, in order to, to produce any film or to have your name on any film either as a writer or an actor or, or a director, you have to be part of the syndicate. So you have to be an approved member of the syndicate. And in order to be a member of the syndicate, you have to, be an, um, uh, you have, to have graduated from the, the Cinema Institute. So if you graduated from anything else, you cannot be a member of the syndicate. Otherwise, like, the only way to do it is to pay money um, to the syndicate for any, any film, short film, anything that you've done as, as separately from, from the um, syndicate. So that's, that's very challenging. The other thing is to start a business that has anything to do with the dissemination of ideas. So something like Wikipedia, something like what we're doing, something like Kabila, my previous business, uh, magazine, anything like that, you need the national security approval. And that's the specific case of Egypt and some other countries. Uh, you need their approval to basically share ideas uh, online, and, and that is definitely threatening because that can take anything from six months to a year. And if you're politically active by any means, no, good luck getting that um, good, get, getting that approval. Another funny example: my co-founder, the CTO, has just got uh, got summoned to the military uh, service for the third time in 11 years. So. We cut, uh, that cut our testing period by five days, for instance, and there is no way that we can challenge that. So definitely the ecosystem is not very encouraging of, of content creation or of creativity, and obviously like, even entrepreneurship, yeah. So just a little bit of data on, on uh, the, the financial proposition. I mean, we're certainly not talking about any unicorns on this panel, but... Um, you're tired of unicorns, uh, but uh, digital advertising uh, it has a 10% ad market share in the MENA um, com compared to 50% market share, uh, as I understand from HALA in, in the US. So that's definitely a lot of room for growth in terms of digital advertising. Who is positioned to capitalize on that growth? Do you guys have any idea aside from the likes of U-Turn? And are there people investing in content in the region like U-Turn? And this is not just the question for the, the, the panel. I guess the audience can weigh in on that. Well, there is, like, we need to encourage creation of content to begin with. If the number is still 1%, this number I've been hearing for three years now, so if there is only 1% of Arabic content to this date, then obviously we need more content, and we need more relevant content, and that's, the, that's what people usually miss, because there's a lot of, for the lack of a better word, crappy content on, on the internet that's in Arabic. There is the, the most visited, when I used to work for Google, the most visited websites within the Arab region, actually number one is, like, Fetakit. Uh, which is like a forum that like women forum and but there there isn't and it's not by any means any good quality there isn't enough content that um that's sort of not just relevant but but something like educational content like one of the biggest 
educational platforms was shut down recently. Um, and there isn't enough content that can actually be capitalized on in terms of advertising, even though that we have a lot of users. Saudi Arabia and Egypt alone have the, ma the majority of users online. So we need to encourage creation of content, and then that will attract uh, advertisers, because obviously advertisers want more eyeballs on their ads, and if they see that there is enough content and enough users going to that content, they're going to advertise. I think this is also where the, the difficulty comes in in terms of Wikipedia, which is uh, we don't offer ads. We don't have ads on our site. Uh, we believe it leads to undue influence in the shaping of educational content. And that is something that is a little bit tricky um, if you're trying to build a digital knowledge infrastructure. If that's based on ad clicks, then I think that you can not kiss a neutral point of view goodbye, but maybe hug it goodbye. <laughs> um, you you get some pretty you get some pretty crazy things going um, in terms of an educational point of view getting corrupted uh, once you are offering advertising. But there's tons of ways that you can educate through entertaining content as well. That that would be great. It's just not in our wheelhouse. So. I'd like to turn to the audience and see if there are any questions that you'd like to address to the panel. Are you guys still awake? <laughs> uh, well, if they're not, I would like to thank our panel for um, the, the conversation. We really appreciate your presence and wish you the best both in Wikimedia and with your adventures, Perihan. Thank you all. Thanks.